Welcome to the Existentialist Society in Melbourne, Australia. I'm David Miller. I'm the secretary. Today's speaker is Dr. Tim Themi, and his topic will be eroticizing aesthetics in the real with Bate and Lacan. Now, Tim, amongst other things, is the author of a book by that title, and he'll be discussing issues raised in the book. And following his presentation, there will be ample opportunity for questions, comments, and discussion. Tim. Thank you, David. And thank you to the uh, Existentialist Society of Melbourne. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, beaming out from Melbourne to, to the world as we are now able to do in the Zoom mirror. The one positive thing perhaps that came from COVID is our ability to connect in this way all around the world, um, almost at will to discuss uh, our favorite things such as philosophy. Philosophy is what I uh, usually teach. I also teach some psychoanalysis at the Lacan Circle of Australia. And uh, philosophy and psychoanalysis are going to be coming into today's talk and uh, about the book um, that it was released uh, uh, under a year, just under a year ago. Uh, that's it over my right shoulder there that you can see. And if we just think about the title, eroticizing aesthetics in the real with Bataille and Lacan. Firstly, eroticizing aesthetics. It's not as if it's just uh, me or anyone or Bataille as a subject who are going to take aesthetics and make it more erotic. There's something already eroticizing about aesthetics in that it invokes the senses, the five bodily senses, the body which is also connected to uh, erogenous zones, the ones that uh, Freud so masterfully outlined at the uh, turn of the last century, the oral, the anal, the, the phallic, the genital, pregenital beforehand is always mixed with the genital um, in the configurations of desire that we see uh, later emerging in, um, in uh, adult life. But we're also going to talk about a process of de-eroticizing aesthetics. So there's a historical sense that I, I want to bring into focus here where once upon a time in a land far, far away, not that far, ancient Greece, not that long ago, uh, you know, two and a half millennia ago, uh, aesthetics already was pretty eroticized. Well, it was certainly more eroticized then than it was um, when the Platonists started to become dominant from the fourth century BC, which was still more uh, erotic, the aesthetics there were still more erotic or eroticized than we saw come later when Christianity took over, a decline of the Roman Empire and around the fourth century AD, uh, bringing forth the 1000 years or so of, uh, of, of the Middle Ages, often known also as the Dark Ages. Um, since then, we've had the Enlightenment and uh, what's happening with aesthetics today? What's happening with erotics today? What's happening with religion today? Uh, uh, because religion was usually the place where uh, the aesthetic dimension would flourish. Say the difference between uh, a poet today writing a poem or, or, or a sculptor sculpting a sculpture or a painter painting a painting and say someone doing it in Homer's time, or Sophocles' time. It was about the religious myths um, rather than about an individual and the human condition and their own specificity and their own uh, cultural milieu. So religion has a role in this process of eroticizing and de-eroticizing aesthetics. Why is it such a big deal? 
Let's have a look at the next part of the title, in the real. What is the real? The real is a term made uh, popular by Lacan. It's also there in nascent form in uh, Bataille, but it's more emphasised in Lacan. And it refers to that which usually evades conscious articulation, that which usually evades our symbolic structures, our structures of language, our customs, our laws, our reason, our process of rationality. If there's something that's going to be filtered out because it's too striking to consider, pertaining to fundamental taboos concerning sex and death, that's the real. So what gets called the real, of course, varies. Like somebody can be more open than someone else. Uh, a whole epoch can be more closed than a previous one or a later one um, as well. Um, but what gets left out in any given point as to anxiety causing or too, uh, um, you know, too shameful is the real. Even if we might be okay to acknowledge this in ourselves, for example, in private, to actually uh, communicate it to someone, it's a different story. It can be hard to communicate it to a partner or a friend, but that's easier than communicating it to a public lecture uh, for the existential society or, you know, any, any sort of like a uh, mainstream or publishing it, for example, um, not as hard as it used to be when it comes to sexuality, but still uh, can be quite uh, tricky. So we're in the real with Bataille and Lacan. Now, Bataille and Lacan, of course, are both uh, French uh, figures. Bataille is a kind of uh, Nietzschean, a kind of French Nietzschean, whereas Lacan is a kind of um, Freudian, a French Freudian. But Bataille also read Freud and really liked his group psychology and was also psychoanalyzed um, early on in his life due to the uh, tumult he felt um, in, his, um, in his life, in his mind, and the tumult that his friends felt too, who were quite concerned about some of his um, uh, behaviour. This was in the 1920s, so he's about in, in, in his mid to late 20s uh, himself. And this is when he starts to write as well. He writes as a kind of dissident surrealist, uh, but always bringing in uh, some of the fundamental insights of, uh, of Freud, which is not completely surprising because as someone very connected to Nietzsche, of course, we know from the Germanophone context that uh, uh, parts of Freud, key parts of Freud were already anticipated by, by Nietzsche. So there's that sort of connection too. So we've got Bataille and Lacan, and the implication is also Nietzsche and Freud. And then some of you might know that Lacan and Bataille uh, knew each other. They were, um, you know, uh, part of groups together, secret societies. If you see one over my right shoulder there, um, a headless figure, the secret society of Asifal. Lacan was uh, allegedly a, uh, a silent witness for those groups and um, early meetings of some of those groups happened in Lacan's apartment and which is where Lacan met um, Bataille's uh, ex-wife the, the movie star, Sylvia Bataille, um, who then went on to become later on in life, uh, Lacan's second wife, Sylvia Lacan. Okay, so eroticizing aesthetics in the real with Bataille and Lacan. Now, part of what we're gonna do when we bring together erotics and aesthetics is think about and ethics, is there a kind of need to have our aesthetics more eroticized rather than less? If we don't get to express our eroticism in aesthetics, where do we get to express it? Well, let's have a look, let's go back and do a bit of history more closely to understand and unpack what that might mean. Now, Bataille's genealogies come in books like uh, his 1957 Eroticism and his books such as his three volume, The Cursed Chair. And he, his history goes back to the Paleolithic era where he talks about the transition from animal to human. 
where we were once animals in the Paleolithic era or very close to the animals, but we put taboos on our animality, those drives pertaining to sex and death, in order to establish an order of things, work, a humanized world, a world of utility, a tool using world. So use the example of if you want to, uh, if there's a storm coming, you need to build a shelter. You need a steady state of consciousness to work out what are the materials, how are we gonna do this? If there's a, a monster on the loose, like a big woolly mammoth or a big, big cat, a tiger or, or a pack of wolves, you need to be able to coordinate a defense. All this sort of organization, this humanization means we can't just access our primitive drives at will. There has to be a time and a place for them. So we set them aside in order to coordinate, in order to master our environment. Um, and the time for reaccessing these drives that have been prohibited was a time of transgression of those normal taboos. We transgress those normal taboos, but only to a certain point. It's just that, and we sort of still have that today, right? Where we work Monday to Friday, and then Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, we, we don't work, we play. Uh, we're transgressing taboos that are normally in place during the week or prohibitions. And in primitive times, that was traditionally done in, uh, in religious ceremonies, religious rituals. Um, and animality was something that still deeply stamped the gods and the goddesses um, in, in these times, all the way up to the, we see this even in the Egyptian gods and the Greek gods, where there's always animal accoutrements. There's a little owl statuette up on the top, my top shelf there, which is of course, Athena's um, animal epithet, but they all had uh, animality attached to them. Dionysus uh, and the snakes, Apollo, also called um, Pythion, slayer of snakes, slayer of Dionysus, um, in terms of the cycle between the two that, that existed in Delphi. But Bataille's point here is that uh, those sexual and violent impulses that were prohibited in order to work and function in a humanized world, build shelters, law, reason, custom, uh, societies. Uh, when we reaccess them after a period, they're not the same as what they were when we left them behind. So there's a kind of Freudian insight here as well, where, where Freud says, when we put drives and instincts under repression, they proliferate, they dam up and take on uh, potentially extreme forms of expression if, if we don't sort of uh, access them enough or have knowledge of them enough if we try to double up on um, prohibition. So instead of like setting aside, setting aside a time for recapturing our um, prohibited drives in some kind of erotic process expressed in aesthetics as part of a religious uh, uh, custom, we try to double up on the, on the prohibition. And that's basically the shift we see happening between uh, Paleolithic times classical archaic times, and then Platonic times, and then Christian times. From Platonism and Christianity, uh, religion becomes a place to reinforce taboos rather than transgress the taboos. Uh, so there's key examples in, for example, um, Plato's Symposium, which uh, Lacan spends a whole seminar discussing. Uh, seminar eight, where Plato and Socrates are there trying to reinvent the Greek myths to make them more pure, to make them less animal, to make them less sexual, to make them less full of passions and violence. Uh, and you might think that's good, especially coming from where we are in history. Oh yeah, <clears throat> like Plato says in the Republic, we, we can't see great kings and gods and goddesses like acting in this way full of passions, full of lust, because then we're going to copy it too. So we've got to make them pure, right? Like, like Jesus and Mary eventually will be, right? We've got to make them pure so that we can reinforce 
our purity, um, turning away from the body and the drives. But the thing that's wrong with that is that the gods and the goddesses weren't necessarily there for us to copy or emulate. Uh, in fact, that was hubris to try and copy the gods and goddesses. They were there to teach us something. They were there to, to create a sort of mirror of what our desire is and give us some access or recapitulation of those drives and desires in key moments, such as the festival. So the Dionysian festival, the sort of classical pinnacle in the way, in, in a way, in, uh, in Athens, uh, that festival is still, that uh, um, theatre is still there today on the slopes of the Acropolis. Um, where you had the sort of um, cognitive complexity of an Aeschylus and, and a Sophocles. Not Euripides, though, according to uh, Nietzsche. And this is where we see that transition point, because as Nietzsche puts it in his Birth of Tragedy, and as Lacan says, like, uh, Nietzsche puts his finger on it in the, in, in the birth of tragedy in pointing to a profound incompetence every time Socrates and Plato touch on the topic of tragedy. And in fact, when we get forward to Plato's Republic, uh, Plato wants to ban Homer. He wants to ban the old poets and the tragedians because their representations of the protagonists aren't uh, pure, moral and rational enough. Euripides started to do that, and that's because he was mates with Socrates, and that's what sort of uh, Nietzsche kind of points out that we start a kind of distortion of the normal taboo transgression relation. And this gets exacerbated in the Platonic era. And we've got to remember that Plato's writings are fourth century BC, the uh, intellectual and creative climax of classical Greece, as Lacan calls it, the fertile moment, the climax, the intellectual climax, was sixth and fifth century BC, BCE. Right, so the 500s BC and the 400s BC. Plato is about 30 as we switch into the fourth century BC and his writings are uh, fourth century in the 300s. And at the end of that century, we have Aristotle um, tutoring Alexander and uh, sp spreading Hellenism uh, all the way to Afghanistan through his um, defeat of the Persian empire. But that's a different Hellenism that's happening there. It's a Hellenistic era. And so when the Romans take over, that also becomes part of their repertoire. So a lot of like uh, Roman emperors, for example, loved the Stoics, who were a version of this Platonic Aristotelian uh, paradigm in, uh, in philosophy. But it was a, it was a kind of a, a hybrid, right? And it was only when Constantine later decriminalizes Christianity, becomes a Christian himself, makes it sort of fashionable, and then afterwards, I think it was Theodosius, um, went from Christianity being decriminalized to it being criminalized not to be Christian. And that's when the apocalyptic events start, the genocides, the book burnings, the temple sackings, um, the original polytheists get labeled uh, pagans, which means rural barbarian peasant or something like that. A very ironic title given the myths that were believed uh, the Christian myths that were adopted like so far after the founding of Western science to really adopt these resurrection myths and parthenogenesis myths. Um, so far after we've had science and enforce belief in them literally and murder people who don't believe it or have a different interpretation of it was an extraordinary loss in intellectual development and standard. And this is something that Nietzsche never stopped um, uh, bemoaning. Um, all the scientific methods, he says, were there with their schools, centuries old, lost overnight. When Christianity took over uh, on soil that was prepared for it by the denaturalizing or anti-natural aspects of Platonism. So Christianity, how does it exacerbate it? I think Lacan's phrase from Seminar 17 here it's, um, is important. It's by splicing Platonism with Yahweh's ferocious ignorance. What's Yahweh ferociously ignorant of? Sexual knowledge and sexual and sexual relations and religious practices that involve some kind of uh, uh, imbrication with nature and sexuality. Uh, so we have a pre-existing sort of denaturalizing tradition in, uh, in the Hebraic tradition, which Christianity then draws from there and from the Platonists, and that's how we end up 
uh, what we had in, in, the, in the Middle Ages, which was a very strict uh, taboo structure. Not only was there was religion not a time to reaccess prohibited animality, but um, animality was more prohibited than ever before. Um, for example, in sexual mores. Um, and then modern science or the modern world, does this improve things? Uh, not quite. Uh, for Nietzsche, the enlightenment, uh, or what was positive for Nietzsche was the Renaissance, but it wasn't allowed to go back far enough. It sort of got stuck a little bit with Plato and Aristotle. And instead of being able to stay there until it recaptured the, the classical area uh, period more fully, the, uh, the, the Protestant Reformation took over. And then everyone had to compete for how pure and, and uh, or Puritan they were um, again. Uh, the Renaissance brought down, says Nietzsche, when, when that mad monk, Luther, went to Rome and said, here I stand, I can do no other. Now, this leads into probably the most dominant and pernicious ideology we have today, the um, ideology of capitalism. How? And this is where Bataille's engagement with Max Weber is very important. It's through, uh, from Luther, we move to Calvin. And Calvin has this idea that God rewards the rich. Or through Calvinism, the idea emerges that God rewards the rich. If you're rich in this world, if you've made a lot of money, it's because you're one of the predestined ones. So there's the myth of predestination that takes over there. You're one of the predestined ones. Um, so there's no ill-gotten gains, to use the Marxist term. It's uh, you showing that you are predestined as one of the good ones who will go to heaven, unlike the bad ones who are all poor. So don't help the poor. They're clearly not predestined. You help yourself make more money to show how you are the predestined one. And it was the English Puritans in the, uh, in the second half of the 17th century, uh, as Bataille points out, that really pushed this uh, to an extreme and gave birth to the, uh, the world of the bourgeois, the, uh, the, you know, the world of, the, of, the, uh, of economic laws and, and reason, so called very easily corrupted as we know today with the massive uh, wealth inequalities we have and constant uh, um, imperialist wars being waged between um, kleptocrats of various nations, Western ones being the richest. So if you're a Calvinist, you think it's because they're the best. If you're, if you're critiquing Calvinism, you think it's that because they're the best crooks. So I um, put that one as an open question for you. Now, what's Bataille going to do with all this? So he sketches out this genealogy after the war, right? So this is his 1949, 1950s work. The 50s were his last productive decade. And this is all what I covered in chapter one. Now, in chapter two, I wanted to go back and look right at the start at this uh, erotic story he wrote, Story of the Eye. And it's going to give us a clue as to what's all this political stuff got to do with this erotic stuff, right? Or this sexual stuff. Um, and the thing about Story of the Eye, so that's written in 1928, was uh, that it was written while Bataille was in analysis uh, with uh, Adrian Borel, one of the first French psychoanalysts. And we see in the sort of signifying play that happens um, in, in the book, for those of you who read it, there's the I, uh, then there's an egg, which becomes an egg, which might become the saucer of milk, which might become the sun, and all the usual sort of verb object relations that go with each object start getting crisscrossed. So, and that's how you have um, an I usually cries, so it might cry or see, right? So it involves light or um, tears. But if the eye is then like the saucer of milk, then an eye could cry uh, milk instead of tears, or uh, somebody could drink my eye as if milk would come out, um, which is what uh, Simone, the female protagonist does to the, to the male narrator. She was drinking my left eye, sucking my left eye 
um, as if milk would come out. And this kind of crisscrossing happens throughout the, the novel. And Bataille gets a couple of post faces where he says where this obsession with the eggs and the eyes came from. And it, it uncovers through this sort of uh, surrealist masterpiece of literature, as um, Sylvia Bataille, Sylvia Lacan later called it. Um, uh, it uncovers this primal scene for Bataille of his father, a uh, syphilitic father, urinating in the bedpan with his blind eyes sort of staring upwards, um, not able to see that his young child was there watching him do it. So um, that's how this sort of fascination with the eye comes into it because he was seeing. So the eye also involves the gaze there. And if you look at how the um, story progresses, there's all these uh, sort of transgressive erotic acts in their sex play directed towards the eye or its substitutes. So for example, the narrator and Simon in their sex play are fascinated with um, doing things to eggs, peeing on eggs, peeing on eggs, then flushing them down the toilet, filling a bathtub up with eggs and crushing on them, peeing on them while crushing them. And this sort of uh, series of substitutions eventually gets located at the end on a priest where they nucleate the priest roll the eye over Simone's body. It's like the gaze caressing the flesh. Simone slips it into her vulva where Bataille's narrator sees it staring at him, crying tears of urine. These tears of urine are also connected to his, um, an episode where his mother went mad and they found her in a creek after she tried to kill herself. And Bataille found her there and it looked as if when she stood up, her dress was pissing the creek water, the way it was sort of stuck. Uh, to her leg and all the water was sort of dripping down. So we have the sort of masculine and feminine sort of identif early identification playing out there too. But if you sort of carefully like look at, and you can do this to a certain extent with Saad's works as well, which Bataille was, uh, and all the serialists were interested in, is that the figures with which they are, they are obsessed with corrupting, um, uh, Marcel, their pure sort of blonde, um, frigid friend um, who then goes mad and dies, kills herself like Bataille's mother tried to, um, hence an unconscious connection. But to, to, to take it out in the figure of the priest in the end, it was all about taking it out against the sort of the eye of bad conscience that had been installed like a panopticon through this Christian structure that was fixating taboos in this way, not allowing a proper space for erotic transgression. So that when the transgression came out, it will be wild and violent and uncontrollable. And what this story is unconsciously doing is trying to locate where the source of this repression is to, to un, unstick it or unpick it, if you like, to reimmerse us back into the fluidity of the real, the fluidity of the licentious Simon's vulva urinating through an eye, gazing back at us, which we're gazing at. So we can reconfigure the taboo transgression relations. So we see there that what starts as a surrealist erotic novel, which, are, which seems to have nothing to do with reality, some suddenly has everything to do with uh, reality. The Thai psychoanalytic reality, which of course is not his alone. Uh, there's key parts of his primal scene that we can relate to Wolfman's or any of Freud's case studies. Uh, we could probably relate it to some of our early um, experiences of discovering sexual difference um, during the phallic phase, um, where the little kid typically doesn't know about sperm and egg, where babies come from, wonders if what's happening in his parents' or her parents' room, uh, wondering where babies are born from. It's, does it involve urine or, or, and feces? That's what they often assume, because there's no, there's no semen or ovulation yet, they're only five, four years old when they start becoming cognizant of this stuff. And this stuff comes out in our later sexual practice, our, our, louder, our later sort of erotic preferences. So if you can go on to any um, uh, sort of a Pornhub sort of, sort of site and see all the sort of oral and anal kind of uh, acts of, of pleasure um, and scopic acts and, uh, uh, and, and phantasmatic scenarios played out that relate to you know, the, the, the writer's 
own experiences or what the consumers generally like, so it relates to their experiences. So we see where this sort of, uh, these sorts of preferences come from and how some of them are pretty much uh, naturally ingrained and better to acknowledge um, rather than repress and then act out in some kind of aggressive form. And also um, the kind of the, almost like a kind of political consequence where, or an ethical consequence where we need some transformation or some, ref we need to reform our morality in some ways. Um, because uh, this stuff repressed in the unconscious does damage to the subject, does damage to the society, does damage to the culture. And actually, and um, yeah, there's some gratuitous violence in story of the eye, but it, it's it's not at the level of uh, say Saad's, but Saad was like, he spent his life in prison. So he's uh, got more to be uh, egregious about, but, um, and he wasn't clear Saad on the relation between taboo and transgression. And Lacan sort of brings this out too, um, that uh, Sartre thinks he can have unlimited transgression as if there's no corresponding role for taboo. But the opposite side of that is Kant, who thinks we can be purely formal without having any transgression, just be like purely moral and reason. And that's why Lacan famously brings those two together. Uh, Kant of Exard, uh, where the latent truth of Sartre is Kant related latent truth of Kant is, is Saad, because uh, Saad as the sadist, if you like, even though he's just as much masochist at times, uh, is to crusade and, and, and moralise in some ways, whereas Kant's uh, moral, rational ethics doesn't really repress desire, but inflames it and creates this sort of uh, sadomasochistic kind of uh, um, uh, outbursts as a result of this uh, inflammation, just as we've seen in the history of Christianity. It's like Freud says, when it comes to love thy neighbor, the, um, the, the, the cultures and, and nations that take up this ideal, uh, their, historic, their historical accomplishments or their historical record doesn't measure up very well according to this ideal. If you consider all the crusades and the inquisitions and the constant wars which are going on to this day and at this moment, all in the name of the good, of course, but um, we can see other motives playing out behind that veil. Okay, so from here, I wanted to look at what, what other kinds of aesthetics Bataille intervened in and also wrote himself, because he was an artist. He was not just a philosopher of art, he was also a novelist. He was not just a novelist, he was also a philosopher of art. So we have those rare occasions where we get um, you know, sometimes you can have a great artist who's not very philosophically developed and you prefer they didn't say much at all. Just, just stay unconscious or don't, don't spoil it for those of us who enjoy your work, where others can be very intelligent, uh, uh, sophisticated um, philosoph uh, philosophers of art, but not almost have no creative bone or instincts in their body, like their own art is pretty amateur or you know, they don't even bother, bother at all. But sometimes you get figures who can do both. And Bataille is one of those um, amazing figures. But straight after this story of the eye, he got into this massive dispute with Andre Breton, the uh, founder of surrealism. And, uh, and this happened through a, a journal that Bataille started uh, editing from about 1928 to 1931 called Documents. Uh, if you see over my left shoulder there, uh, the, uh, a book facing you, Undercover Surrealism. That's uh, an, based on an exhibition uh, curated um, based on all the sort of materials that were in documents. So it was juxtaposing text with um, ethnographic uh, photos and data and uh, surrealist and, and other modernist paintings. So for example, there's some striking Picasso's in there, Dali's in there, although Dali got caught between this sort of tug of war between Bataille and, and, and Breton and, wanted to withdraw his, his painting from it. And so there's some debate there. Um, Miro, Bataille's friend, is, is in there. Another figure I haven't mentioned is Marcel Mauss, the uh, French sociologist and anthropologist who uh, was the nephew of Emile Durkheim. Um, and Levi-Strauss is also a sort of final uh, kind of uh, heir, heir to. Um, but Marcel Mauss was contributing to documents and what's interesting, and uh, people like Bataille are really enlarged by intending 
Marcel Mauss's lectures. This is where this anthropological understand, understanding of the taboo transgression came from. And it's interesting to note that Freud was also drawing from this French sociological tradition in the group psychology works that Bataille liked, for example, um, uh, Totem and Taboo, obvious one. The one is um, the uh, group psychology and the analysis of the ego, where Freud specifically talks about uh, how there's always a, a, a time set aside periodically to transgress usual taboos. The taboos themselves seem to be coexistence with an increasing amount of temptation. It's a little bit like uh, forbidden fruit tastes finer, finest. If the fruit was never forbidden, you might think, oh, yeah, fruit's all right. But if you're banned from having fruit, suddenly, you know, you can think of nothing else. Of course, you might not care that much about fruit, but um, when it comes to sexual acts, those prohibitions do dam up and do kind of become more and more enticing. And if there's never an outlet for them or a sufficient outlet for them, that's where we get into trouble. But Bataille's early work was so violent, he wrote this book and then burnt it, but some of it survived and Baton saw some of it, where Bataille admitted he wrote this as an assault on all dignity. That was, that was his words. And these were like before he went into analysis and things like that. Some of this, some of this work survived in Story of the Eye, just some fragments, some in Inner Experience, his work from the 40s. Some made it to uh, the opening of Blue and Noon, his um, political novel in uh, during the 30s, which I discussed in chapter six. But back to this dispute with Bataille. So Bataille thought that Bataille was an excremental philosopher, always fixated on the lows. On the you know on, on the shit stain on Icarus's Icarus's trousers, right? Where Breton uh, in return thought, I mean Breton in return thought Breton was flying too high like Icarus towards the sun, and he was going to come to a crash because he never allowed a kind of an acknowledgement of the low roots of some of these sublimations. But um, if you look at like what like Bataille is actually saying in this documents journal, he's, he's totally aware of a whole cycle between the high and low, and he's only privileging the base material uh, as a repost to those who are fixated on the high and want to give a mathematical or moral frock coat to everything that is. Um, they would eventually come, come together. There's a reproachment between them later. But it's interesting to consider this in terms of aesthetics where can art be, should art be high or should it be low? Should art be about the beautiful or should it be, should it be about the ugly? Uh, which one is more authentic, if you like? And the answer is that art has to somehow incorporate the whole cycle. Um, if you say art should be about beauty, you think of a beautiful Apollinian work, I say, okay, what's so beautiful though about um, Oedipus like gouging out his eyes after he realises he accidentally killed his father and slept with his mother. That's a horrible, horrid theme. But yet there's still beauty in it because the way it's written, the way it's performed, the poetry. Same with Antigone. What's, what's so beautiful about this you know, self-willed victim being executed by the king who's then punished by the, by the gods and goddesses in horrible terms? It's the beauty effect created by Antigone's countenance that, that creates this... Uh, this law. So there's a cycle between beauty and ugly, and, and there's some art that's not tragic, that's, that's more focused on beautiful, there's some art that's more, uh, you know, dark and low and disturbing, uh, accessing the base material. But there needs to be a mixture of the two, but but I was going to say that in art, we've got to make sure we're getting our erotic outlets. If we don't get it there, it's going to end up in our, our politics and our acting out, and that's where it does damage. One of the things Bataille also did was go back and consider um, Paleolithic art. Uh, the cave paintings of Lascaux in particular, because um, it's better. Uh, because they're in this initial transition from animal to human. It's not as if the, the gods and goddesses had animal attributes. They were the animals. So there were these magnificent paintings of, of lions and, and tigers and, and, and mammoths painted with absolute care and, and amazing accuracy. And 
they're dated around, I don't know, like something 30,000 BC, 15,000 BC, 20,000. There was another one discovered after his death, after Bataille's death, the Shobi Cave, which um, as a German filmmaker, he made a film about it. Um, uh, Werner Herzog, I think is his name, just worth checking out. But he thinks this is very important because it shows that uh, religion was once a time for divine animality, a return to the animal body. And this is also Nietzsche's expression of what art is. It's a blooming physicality, an abundance of animal physical energy being expressed through an abundance into the work as a gift, as a gift to the polis to make good their, their sacrifice. So debates about making up uh, pure and um, politically correct and they sometimes, you know, miss the point and sound just like what the Christians would have done or, the, or Plato would have done, but with different, different invectives involved uh, um, in today's age. Now, Nietzsche is very important for Bataille for this because he says that Nietzsche allows for a space for subject, for sovereignty for the subject, a place where it's beyond concerns for utility, morality and the good. There's a time for it's just you and your drives and your objects of desire. And he thinks Nietzsche in his work and his, his life, the way he conducted it, uh, what he achieved, how his life was set up to achieve these works, these sovereign moments. Um, uh, for Nietzsche, it was about going beyond this anti-natural morality, right? Which Christianity and Platonism did uh, for him. You know, that section in Zarathustra on the despisers of the body, for example, is a good way to sort of see what he's saying there. But Bataille's focus is also on this is also that in doing this, Nietzsche goes beyond utility because Bataille was concerned that the modern form of kind of moralism was utilitarian thinking that everything has to be about work and productivity. And what you do with the surplus of your work, you reinvest it in more productivity. Uh, it's productivity for the sake of productivity, accumulation for the sake of accumulation. And so one of Bataille's watchwords became about having a space or a time for a transgression of those normal taboos so we can be non-productive, so we can have non-productive expenditure, so we can do something that's not useful. Art should be not useful, not productive. Um, it should be the opposite. It's our break from being productive and useful and thinking about means, ends, calculations. And this is something that comes out in Bataille's intervention into aesthetics in all different periods and all different fields uh, of the art. Uh, chapter four. Here I wanted to talk about modernism and how surrealism as a branch, or how modernism in general, made use of both Nietzsche and Freud. Uh, but paradoxically, so we think modernism, it's all about the new, right? Make a new guy, damn it, is one of the, the key figures said. Um, but the paradox there, the irony there is that Freud and Nietzsche were influenced because they went back to the old. And that's how we find this sort of paradox where primitivism is a part, a branch of modernism. And according to Bataille, the actual express meaning of, of surrealism itself was its primitivism, where just as in the Renaissance, the Greeks or the, the Romans, thought that God died, or the, the Westerners in general felt, began in Florence, uh, they strayed too far from the ancient Greek and Romans, right? And so they went back to recover what had been lost. What uh, the surrealist modernists are doing, and Bataille among them, are going back to prehistoric time, going back even further to recover what was lost, using Freudian techniques of free association. So we see in the story of the eye how Bataille's free association on the couch with his analyst uncovers all these uh, signifying material which he only later makes sense of and actually has a, a point, a profound point to make about the world we live in um, while still performing its main task of erotic discharge. Um, it was the same with what the surrealists were doing with automatic writing, right? They were basically um, overtly and stating that they were using Freud's technique of free association, a relaxation of, of, the, of, of the watch of the watch of reason you know, on the gates of the unconscious to let it, let it flood through. 
So that's sort of that sovereign, that sovereign space for the subject beyond our normal objective, moral, cognitive thinking. Let it flow where we see all this amoral material uh, come out, connected to our, our past and our present um, desires. So just as psychoanalytically, we can go back to our own roots. We can also go back with the help of ethnography and you know, Malsian anthropology um, and ethnography to the beginning of the actual um, uh, uh, species, human species, right? And it's transition from animal to human, uh, just as Nietzsche was doing back to the pre-Platonic Greeks, but spread to all parts, uh, you know, to the Americas, to the Australian Aboriginals, to all the, and all times, to bring forth this material, extra data, in order to go back and, and go forward, and then get a run-up to go forward in a, in a new way, a way that we can restructure society to correct this imbalance between taboo and transgression that, uh, that um, Bataille diagnosed. But the importance of Bataille's Nietzscheanism is that there is a slight difference between Nietzsche and Freud. They're, they're about I think, 12 years apart in age in the Germanophone context. But there are key moments where Freud seems more positive about the drives compared to Freud who seems more Schopenhauerian, more, more of a Schopenhauerian pessimist about him. Not, not Freud's no like hater of, of libido. He's obviously he's criticizing repression a lot, but compared to Nietzsche, there's more of a demand for affirmation of the real, affirmation of what's usually left out, affirmation of those drives, and a sublimation redeploy the deployment of them. Whereas when you're uh, through the arts, for example, well with Schopenhauer, it's like uh, you know the libido leads to no good. Just, just loss and castration and impotence and misery and reject, rejection and betrayal. So don't bother. So for Schopenhauer, art was about escaping from the, the real. Uh, um, where for Nietzsche and Bataille, it was the opposite. It was about affirming uh, the drive from the real. And Freud's not, not that close to Schopenhauer, but just compared to Nietzsche, there is a more of an affirming... Uh, and transformative uh, incentive that comes from nature. And this comes out in uh, Bataille's analysis of, um, of literature in particular, which I discussed in chapter five. Um, he says, does Bataille, what's basically going on in literature is this conflict between two forms of happiness. And you see it coming out in the different positions people take of what's literature for or what's art for. So for Stendhal, um, it was the promise of happiness. Um, for Kant, it was about disinterest, right? The, op the opposite of, say, sexual happiness. And as Nietzsche points out, for Schopenhauer, it's an interpretation of Kantian disinterested in a very interested way. It's like, I'm very interested in escaping from my sexuality because it pains me so much. And that's what art's about. I praise art in a disinterested way, right? I'm objective. It's about being objective, devoid of the subject. Where Nietzsche and Bataille are no more for the subject. It's the time for the subject to reemerge. Uh, get it out of your system there. Learn something about it. Learn something about desire. Uh, don't act it out blindly at, at the office or in parliament uh, like a... a that often happens um, in our today. Uh, yeah, for example, the idea that uh, great power centers are fighting over who gets to sell fossil fuels to who and which oligarchs make the money, which they never pay tax on, just pile up their towers in tax havens, instead of using that money to transition to green uh, technology, which the planet needs to survive, is absolutely ridiculous. And it's, it's completely consistent with the historical record um, it's just inconsistent with people thinking who think we've made progress uh, or, or that we've made enough progress. Um, if you disattach yourself from the culture industry and the, the propaganda that they like to put out and see what the real is, uh, a whole different story um, emerges. We in the Christian West are by no means the pure, innocent uh, Jesus figures uh, with the right to lecture the world about what a great blessing to humanity we are. Not at all. Uh, there's much more work to be done. Now, so there's two forms of happiness. One connected to taboos, right? The happiness of security, social security, accumulating reserves. But then there's the happiness of spending that money or spending that energy, 
say, uh, at a festival or in a, in a, in a pursuit of a sexual, sexual relation. And they're both important. And it's all about making sure that uh, one is for art and one is for politics, not getting them confused, which Bataille thinks we've done today. And one of the ways this plays out is the dominance or the necessity for evil in literature. So for example, he, Bataille looks at figures like Emily Bronte, the figure of Heathcliff, almost a sadistic figure, um, the figure of William Blake, uh, the work of William Blake, and his idea that um, evil was energy from the body, which was something that was, you know, productive and should be utilised in some ways. He also looks at, um, say, the evil of, of not growing up, just the sort of sovereignty of remaining in that infantilism. For example, uh, Kafka's work in, uh, you know, there's a sense where Kafka always felt that he was, he was still a child, rebelling against his family's pressure for him to pursue commercial interests, because if you pursue a career in, in art, it's, it's not really for commercially viable. It's so much the wrong question to be uh, asking, uh, although you can, of course, be concerned for someone's well-being um, if they go too far into it. So it's about sort of recapturing Dionysus from his consignment to the devil. And he looks at Baudelaire too. It's almost like that... Um, that, uh, that Mick Jagger line, a Rolling Stones line of having some sympathy for the devil because in the devil is all the like parts of our animality that's been left out and negated. So through this engagement with evil or the devil in a kind of black mass as we've seen the Thai story of the eye, we're able to maybe recapture what makes us who we are sexually and uh, redeploy that, make it really available for sublimation um, rather than repress it and act it out. And he looks at a few uh, poetic figures as well to, to, to sort of, to like uh, René Char and Jack Prevert, to sort of try and overcome this sort of Homer, Plato versus Homer kind of, um, uh, kind of rivalry that plagues Western, Western societies. Where we're always trying to ban the poets uh, from, our, uh, from our ideal republic. Um, we're always trying to purify our art to make it more moral, more politically correct. Uh, we're always trying to, you know, ban and censor pornography or nudity um, and a whole host of other, other things. Now, the final chapter, chapter six, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to then think about, okay, Bataille's coming up with this separation between art and politics, right? Uh, connected to transgression of normal taboos, reaccessing of erotic animality, and then politics connected to respect for taboos, where we're able to be rational and reason and fair and, and equitable in our distribution and accumulation of resources. Um, so can we never mention politics in art at all? Um, or isn't there some way that we still can? Now, in our topsy-turvy world, there's a sense where we, all, we always have to in some ways. We, we, because nobody's uh, sufficiently acknowledging certain deficiencies within politics. They're all, you know, in a sense, a bunch of liars. Uh, they're artists without them being their artists. They say they're speaking the truth, but they're actually constructing fictions while calling them truth. So there's a sense where uh, it's, it's natural that art will pick up politics in some way. But the important thing for it is to still do it in a way that gives us that sort of erotic release. And Bataille was able to do this in a wonderful novel from the 1930s called Blue of Noon, which he did not publish at the time because it was set during the Spanish Civil War. And before he got a chance to publish it, um, the, the war was over and the fascists had taken over. And the book was about the uh, portents of the rise of fascism. And he said, like, why, why bother with the portents once the reality has already happened? But his friends convinced him later in life in 1957 to publish it, and it's a fantastic novel where uh, you, you can sort of see what his sort of overall point is by the, the attachment he has with three main feminine figures. There's um, Lazar, who's modelled on Simone Weil, the Christian socialist revolutionary, and it's sort of a critique of her uh, asceticism, the idea that some kind of ascetic ideal uh, of becoming pure is what we need to, to create a revolution and fix all the problems of oppression and exploitation um, from the bourgeois corruption to the betrayal of the revolution in, a, in, in, a, in a communist Russia. 
And, uh, but then you see her perverse aspects coming out in key moments, which undermines her own project, which is, isn't, is she, which she isn't really able to rationalize either without regressing to some kind of Christian myth. Uh, the idea that, you know, like a Tyson narrator asks her and a, or a grandfather, a grandfather or a stepfather, so why are you a communist or socialist or whatever? And Lazar's like, uh, well, we cannot betray the, uh, you know, the working class. And the narrator's like, okay, but why? Well, one, one should all, you know, one should at least try to save one soul. And it's like, save it for what? So Lazar needs the sort of uh, horizon beyond the grave to make her um, her kind of uh, socialist practice practice work, which is why I called. Uh, that section, superficial socialism, the case of Lazar. Uh, and there's all these descriptions of how Batai's narrator is just revolted by her macabre appearance, a sort of frizzy hair going everywhere and like dirt under her nails and looking shabby. And uh, just because this complete neglect of, of the libido, of, of eroticism. Um, and then there's a second uh, uh, connection that the narrator makes with a figure called Xeni. Um, who sort of stands in for the sort of superficial surrealist, the dilettante who sort of, you know, reads this journal, reads that journal, it keeps up, and professes a communist views, but really has not touched uh, the base, the real. Um, so it's like a superficial version of aesthetics. So there's no satisfaction in politics, no satisfaction in the arts either, as represented or crystallised by these two figures, Lazar and Zeni. But the third figure, uh, Dirty, who's modelled on uh, Bataille's lover at the time, uh, Colette Pignot, who's uh, Laura, was her pen name. She was also a writer. Um, she is straight into the real, like she's really into uh, having a hugely debaucherous time with Bataille's narrator, Trotman, but so much so that it risks their lives and leads to impotence in, uh, in the narrator because he's, he's, he respects her so much for being so sovereignly transgressive with her sexuality. But he's also scared to death, as is uh, as is Dirty herself, and this means he can't perform. So Dirty leaves him, and then there's a sort of reunion at the end where they get back together, and and Trotman sheds his connections with Lazar and Zenny. And this sort of connection where they're working through Dirty still got these horrible like uh, impulses, like she apologizes for not being dead, she fantasizes about them being war, and you know people dying and family dying. Uh, you see the sort of metaphorization, still attacking the mores, which allow no space for eroticism to be properly explored. And then there's the final figure of the Nazi marching band getting ready on the, on the platform um, with their sort of uh, Icarian pose of perfection and purity, the purity of the race. And you know, Trotman's reflecting how gross and perverse they really are, but unconsciously, like, the drummer is really jerking off a big monkey penis, for instance. So Trotman describes them. But the train wastes no time departing, right? And we see a sort of resurgence of this in a way today, right? We've got the resurgence of fascism in the 21st century. Uh, did anyone see that coming when the, when the wall came down, um, the so-called wall of communism? Um, maybe it's inexplicable, but we have it. We have it. We've had a resurgence of this. Some figures um, call it a postmodern 1930s that we find ourselves in. Why? Because we still have this art and politics relation uh, all wrong. In particular, in politics, we've got the crisis of the bourgeois, the corruption of the bourgeois, right? There was the 2008 crash, for example, which leads to more socialism for the rich, more austerity for the poor. Uh, where do they go? They go to the, do they go to the genuine left? What, what, what satisfaction are they going to get there if the, if the sort of establishment left is spending all the time, all the time trying to show how pure they are by uh, making us all politically correct in our sexual lives or sexual expressions or in our aesthetic expressions? doesn't really appeal. And they're doing it in a way because they can't really attack the bourgeois, the oligarchs, the Western oligarchs, because that's where campaign funding is coming from, example. But if they do go to the, like, the far left, which might be a, a chance for a proper socialist revolution, uh, how much have they re, re, recaptured the aesthetic, the erotic, the psychoanalytic? Uh, or they still like Lazar? And one of the things that uh, Bataille's group was doing in the 1930s after documents was trying to exceed and enlarge on Marxism 
by um, because they could see that Marxist practice was foreclosing the realm of jouissance that the fascists were able to utilize and exploit at will with the sort of marching bands and the girls twirling and pretty blonde dolls at the front and these this backward nationalism about the purity of race, how you're all going to be proud and et cetera, et cetera. And so we still have that sort of uh, stuck position. We're still the split subjects of politics, left, right, left, right, but no real transformation is possible. And there's a section in Marx, which I, which I found, which, which because one of the main propaganda, uh, propaganda items against us going to the genuine left is also the idea that it leads straight to, to what happened in Russia, Stalin or Mao. But that's actually like not what, what according to Marxist theory. Uh, for example, Marx thought communism could only work in a, in a society where productivity was already high, where the bourgeois was already developed. In other words, Germany, England, France, right? And Lenin and Trotsky knew this, but they thought we'll have the revolution now, our bourgeois is too weak, right? going straight from feudalism to communism. Germany and the others will eventually convert too, and then they'll help us, which of course Germany and England didn't do. They doubled down on capitalism and declared a war on, the, on, the, on communism. And um, so what we saw in Russia was not communism as all, at all. It was authoritarianism and primitive accumulation, two forms of violence competing uh, against each other. So uh, we have this sort of split of, of political subject. Uh, split political subject, which um, is uh, not really serving us well and leaving uh, certain problems that are intractable. Um, yeah. Okay. I might leave it there and uh, let David take over and uh, uh, then we'll throw over to some discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Tim Femi.